Yeah, you, we're getting folks in, Mark. Awesome. Hey, Teresa. Welcome, everyone. Oh, they're really coming in now. Oh, good. It must Adam, be you. <laughs> Ira, <laughs> Kelly, Magda, Tanya. So for those of you that, that see um, my Friday show with Rob Crispin, he gives me a really hard time about greeting everybody as they come in. But I think it's so fun to see so many new um, faces and or so many new names and so many friends that join us. So uh, I have to say hi to everybody. It's just friendly. Yeah. Uh, awesome. But we got Alan and Ashlyn, Bridget. So exciting. Kevin, Lindsay. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining us. We, um, we're going to kick things off. Uh, for those of you that have been a part of Spark Lab in the past, you'll know this is not anything new, but um, I want to make sure everybody has a good sense of what we talk about here and what this is all about and why it's so important. And so um, just to kind of give everybody a good sense of what we're going to what we're going to talk about and how you can participate. We want this to be something that's really interactive. So if you have questions for Mark or myself, please put them in the chat. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we also want to make sure that um, if you have future topics that you want us to talk about here, that we can tackle some of those and make sure that we bring in really good speakers uh, that can help us. Um, make sure that we touch on all the angles to whatever topic it is that you want to discuss. But really, this discussion is all about innovation in the industry. And we think about innovation oftentimes with technology, but um, it's not just technology, really. It's all about leadership. Um, and leadership really looking around the corner with where they feel like the market is going and then designing intentionally something that's differentiating for their company to tackle what they feel like is coming. So it's a little bit of like future prediction, a little bit of trying to get ahead of the curve of what could be coming um, in the market and, and answering that either consumer demand or, or opportunity need. And so we're going to look at innovation in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now on artificial intelligence. And so we are going to spend a couple of our sessions really this year talking about artificial intelligence. Um, and so I thought we'd start off today with uh, some conversations that Mark is going to help with. Uh, for those of you that have not met Mark, actually, for those of you that have not met me, I'm Melissa Langdale. I'm the president and COO of the Mortgage Collaborative. We're super thrilled that you are here with us today. Um, and I am joined with Mark Cunningham, who is the CEO and co-founder of Train. Um, Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Of course. Thanks. Um, I'm super excited about our conversation. Uh, there are lots of discussions right now around artificial intelligence in the industry, and I'm really excited to get your perspective on things. But before we dig into it too much, I think it would be helpful for everybody to know what Trained does. Can you tell us a little bit about your company? Absolutely. So um, I didn't find the original product, but um, after um, I had... Um... Uh, you know, sold and brought in private equity into my last company, which was uh, Sales Boomerang Mortgage Coach, now known as Trust Engine, uh, still operating. Um, I was looking for uh, going, I still love building lender solutions. And so I was looking for a solution that could really impact and drive down the cost of a mortgage, both, you know, first and foremost for, for you guys, for lenders, but also ultimately benefiting the consumers. And, you know, the cost of a loan uh, has been recorded as $13,000 per closed loan. You know, when you think of all of the paperwork and minutia and everything that we process and with the latest version of AI, you know, it, Amazon will tell you that AI has been out for 20 years, you know, and that's machine learning. There's a difference, you know, in the last couple of years, as far as the capabilities of what large language models and AI can do. And so finding the right opportunity to help really make an impact and a solution to drive costs down for lenders is what train does. And so we've um, captured the uh, trademark for AI mortgage manufacturing. And of course, there's a lot of great manufacturing tech out there. So we're looking to basically imp you know, implement large language models that you can initially and immediately take you know, ROI to your, you know, to your operations in and uh, make it so that you don't have to spend all of the dev and the R&D and the, the expensive people that it costs to put that kind of stuff in. So, yeah. and then finding practical solutions, you know, and practical means it needs to make sense from a, a 
affordability perspective to harness it. Lenders need that solution to drive down the cost of a loan. And then um, also it needs to drive an ROI. It's, it's, it's okay to you know, brag and say, you've got AI, but then what does it actually do for me? And that's, that's, that's right. what I wanted to find and help evolve you know, in this industry. Yeah, it's uh, it's one thing to have kind of a flashy object, but hopefully that yeah. flashy object actually helps you to be more profitable or gain extra revenue, right? And so, or hopefully That's both. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to get into large language models, uh, but I think it would be healthy just to make sure we level set. Um, you started talking about machine learning and the differences between machine learning and artificial intelligence, really what we know today. Um What's really, can you break down like in simplistic terms, if we were like to talk to our 10 year old child about the difference between automation and artificial intelligence, like how would you explain that to them? Okay, so um, automation traditionally or the, what we've seen so far in a lot of the tech that exists today is pre-programmed rules-based you know, um, code. I, I, I talk to my kid, my 10 year old, like an adult. So forgive me if I don't say oh, okay. it. Okay. All right. Like <laughs> That's and all right. Can... I, I can translate for you if we need to, but that, that, makes, that makes yeah. a ton of sense. And he negotiates better than me, by the way, my kids. Do, so. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but anyways, um, the real difference, I'll just try to say it in the simplistic terms, you know, it took engineers and a lot of human effort to continuously keep rules-based code up to date and functioning. And we're in an industry where overlays change all the time. The assembly line changes all the time. The market goes like this, right? And so you have to adapt. And then the regulations change too. And so when that happens, you have to pay engineers to change those rules. And then that implements to the code and then your workflows and so on. So the difference is now is that with the latest version of AI and LLMs, the, the possibility is, is that you know they can adapt to themselves. And as you train, uh, hence the name, train, <laughs> um, as you train you know, the LLMs and apply them to different um, data sets, right? You can, you can get them to do certain functions for us. Maybe they're terrible at some things and there are many more applications to discover over the next you know, decade actually. Oh. Um, and that will create new jobs. Some yeah. jobs will go away, but that'll create new jobs and new opportunities. Uh, and it'll also automate a lot of minutia types of things that we all have to do. So. That's that's really the difference um, in, in the latest tech. So, the way that I like to think about it, um, for those of you that might need a different a different view of it, but the way that I think about it is, one is creating a funnel, right? You're creating a very specific track. Um, in in cases of automation or machine learning, you're creating. If this one thing happens, then you can do this, and it's a very specific track that like. Mark was saying, it doesn't let you have that flexibility as a guideline changes, or maybe your business model changes, and you want to go from, uh, you know, just offering retail origination to now being able to have multi channels, maybe correspondent or wholesale, or you want to offer different products like conventional to FHA to VA to USDA. If you create these very specific funnels, now you've got to create like a whole different track for this new product or a whole different track for this new kind of sales cycle. And so, um, you know, it's it's to me, the difference in automation is kind of building one track that things move on or building a foundation that whatever is sitting on that foundation has the ability to find the information on its own and learn as you build the foundation that's firmer. Um, is that fair? It is absolutely. And okay. one of the benefits of that that's you know moving that's speeding things up is the the large language models. I, I'll keep referring to LLM because that's okay. really the the nitty gritty of what the new AI is based on. And yeah. so that's like your chat GBT and all that kind of stuff. There's there's okay. more than one LLM out there. But okay. um, you know, uh, it's speed the the rate at which it can process and learn is speeding up like every month. <laughs> and it was apparent to me when I started looking at train as you know um, friends with Jonathan the original founder um, it would take longer to actually train the system to do things and now that time it's taking is much faster to train something and it's amazing what you know some of these LMs already know and you know at, out there that's in the data so you're able to harness that and really really fast forward uh, very quickly in what you're trying to accomplish I want to talk about the speed of evolution for AI right so 
as we continue to build out these large language models, and I mean, they're specifically called large for a reason. These are data sets that have to be huge to cover all sorts of areas of our industry. And they need multiple ways to think through something. Otherwise, if you just upload a guideline set, for example, mm -hmm. um, and you say, hey, I don't know, uh, we'll call our AI Andrea. Hey, Andrea, go find the guideline for how to calculate income. Well, it could pull the guideline for how to calculate income for a conventional loan, but that might be different in your specific scenario to how it would consider things for FHA or USDA or VA, for example, right? So it, it needs context. And so building out those large language models with a really big data set and then connecting all of that data intentionally is really, really important to making sure that these platforms give good information. But the more that they learn, the faster that they learn, the more they can take in, the more they can um, uh, create solutions that are really, really more valuable for the industry. But that speed is spe speeding up every day. Um, so, you know, it, that speed of evolution, it, it kind of affects lenders two different ways, right? You've got some that are super excited about it and they're like, oh, this is amazing. Like, you know, if I think about the, um, in the 20, gosh, 22 years that I've been in the business and the 25 before that, that my parents were in the business, we went from an industry of taking pieces of paper that people pushed across the desk to us. And then we took a picture of the piece of paper and we put it up on our, you know, screen and we're like, hey, we're digital, right? We didn't need, we didn't need necessarily the paper, but we still needed the paper. We just looked at the pictures of the paper. And now we're starting to transition into how do we leverage data um, for our industry? And so we're, as, as we started to transition to that, that kind of point, the speed at which we can evolve so many things in our industry, I think is really, really fun. Um, so we're at this point where folks are super excited about what's possible. I, I'm curious to, to hear your input, knowing that you're building this, right? You're, you're seeing that speed of evolution on a regular basis, and you're probably having to think about how you evolve your technology on a regular basis um, as a result. So you know, where we are today with, you know, it's simplistic things like leveraging chat GPT mm -hmm. or leveraging maybe even some tools for even a little bit of graphic design mm -hmm. um, for a company. So like very practical kind of use cases for AI um, that are that are relatively like simplistic in nature. They don't require like um, needing security around non-public information or, you know, things like that, the things that a lender could pick up today and try to take advantage of. But as you start to think about like the future of, of automation and the future of kind of workflow design and mortgage, how do you see AI um, being like critical to that? Like what, what do you see that, that, that evolution, I don't know, that journey of evolution looking like? Yeah. So I think initially, you know, we're, we're evolving as many companies are. There's, there's 43,000 companies. I think I last read trying to evolve on chat GPT. So we're, I'm not the only one, <laughs> but you know, we're all trying to evolve. But um, that being said, it still does take multiple technologies and, and layers, if you will, like you want to set up these layers, because if you take an LLM out of the box, it's going to be wrong. Sometimes even 90% of the time to start, maybe it's 50%. It's we found that some specific LLMs, uh, different ones. So like Google has Gemini, there's ChatGPT, yeah. you know, uh, Elon Musk is trying to convert X into his own <laughs> LLM. Um, but some of them are better at different things than the other. So there's no one fits all solution. Also, certain technologies are still valid. Like for example, machine learning still works better over certain things than it does on other things. Mm -hmm. And so combining technologies Another thing is human in the loop. It still requires human in the loop to train and test things. And the internet already has, uh, and we'll talk about this later, but the data bias in it. And so it's important when you condition, you know, if you're going to start testing and working with it, that you condition over a really widespread data set, right? So that you can take in all kinds of scenarios and then you end up with a very neutral bias instead of one way or the other. And yeah. so that's kind of how we develop today, but I'll, I think it's good to compare, you know, in history, like the the internet came out, like I think in the nineties and before that there was an intranet with the military and different things. We had bulletin board services when I was a kid, which, you know, before internet. Yeah. Um, 
And just like you, I've been in the industry for a while, but it took, you know, from the nineties to like the early two thousands, it took a period of time to figure out just how to apply it and for it to evolve. And we're in the same thing. I actually believe that this is the, the second, you know, iteration of the digital revolution. We had the industrial revolution at the early 1900s. That's where machines and automating with machines happened, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of human labor of, you know, it, it became a tractor instead of somebody, you know, raking a, a garden or something. Um, but, you know, you fast forward, same thing. It'll take a few more years to actually discover what it can evolve to in the applications and then that'll speed up. And the difference here though is, is that, I, you know, I believe this is going to move a lot faster. And, you know, like, for example, there's probably a lot of anybody that's in tech here may use Copilot, you know, from Microsoft. It's, wow. It'll go out and find a lot of the application for, you know, what we're discovering. And so that's speeding up that process, uh, you know, very quickly. And I think it's just really important to, so if I had to say, you know, how do you harness that? Like, if you look at lenders, they're in business to obviously close loans and not everybody has a huge budget to hire this tech team. So I think the best thing you can do is try to just really define what it is you're trying to solve for. And then you have a champion that owns that outcome of what you're trying to solve for. And then you're looking for those technologies with AI to get it evolved to where you want it to be. Um, because it, there is a lot of discovery and that's expensive right now, I will say, yeah. but that'll get cheaper over time. We did get a question um, in the Q and A, and um, so we'll we'll start off with that. But I, I think we could probably pull in some practical use cases for folks too. Um, but the question is it, it, a little bit of a statement in question, but it says e notes is a great example. The fact that it's not everywhere and more widespread is amazing, um, and and that's that's real. That you know e notes is is a way for us to differentiate a customer experience. It's also a completely different way of us to store um, closing documentation. And, um, you know, so that that's a piece of kind of that, that digital evolution that you started to talk about earlier. Um, it made me think of, have you ever seen the movie? Um, oh gosh, what's the movie? Oh my gosh, I had it, it was top of mind. It was where <laughs> these, these ladies are, um, they're, they basically are calculators and they work for NASA and it's the most phenomenal movie. I'm going to have to oh. look at it now. Um, uh, yes, yeah, Hidden Figures. See. Thank you, Bridget. What is it? Uh, Hidden, Hidden figures. figures. Oh, okay. Yeah, I knew somebody would know here. Um, so it is this phenomenal movie about these ladies that, well, it's really about NASA, um, but it, it's, it's this journey of these four women that work at NASA and they get pulled into different things when NASA was very unfriendly um, to, it, it, women didn't have the ability, I won't say they were unfriendly, but women didn't have the ability of kind of uh, growing um, their careers in the same way that that uh, men did at the time. It's right. an old movie, um, but they there was this um, this group of women that uh, they brought in like the first calculator, and it was this giant IBM machine that they couldn't actually fit through the door. It was so big. Um, they they ended up figuring out a way to get it through the door, get it into the building um, and get it into this room. And then literally nobody knew how to use it. And these ladies knew that it was coming and they had trained themselves. So it was this one wow. we had trained herself and then she trained her whole team on it and they just raised their hand and they were like, we're ready. Oh, wow. um, so that. that sounds amazing. That's yeah. Awesome. It's, it really is a very, very cool movie. If y'all have not seen it, I would highly recommend it, but it makes me think of, um, you know, you mentioned that that there's going to be some new opportunities for folks. There's going to be some some jobs today that our industry has that may not be the same job in the future. And mm -hmm. we hear it over and over again that those folks that really um, um, the folks that that leverage AI to or leverage technology in and of itself to kind of be their highest and best use are the folks that are really going to continue to, to grow and excel. And so it's programs like this that make me super excited because I want to be able to make sure that our industry is prepared and that we can we can really evolve together um, yeah. and, and make sure that we're we're all kind of moving uh moving forward and lowering that cost of origination as you mentioned for so many lenders. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, we started to talk a little bit about, I want to get into use cases, so I don't want to veer off too much from that. 
But we started to talk about kind of the excitement that lenders have around the speed of evolution. There also are some questions, though, uh, that a lot of lenders have. And so I, I think we'd be um, at a loss if we didn't kind of talk about both angles. Uh, so the questions that I hear all the time are, OK, well, what really are my risks? What um, how am I going to be regulated with this? What's um, you know, I, I just until I know those things, I don't want to heavily invest in this area. Uh, so I want to like I, I want to give everybody a little bit of an update on some things that we've heard. Uh, we've had some discussions with CFPB. Um, around this very specific topic. And uh, as you all know, they, they came out with a statement on, on this particular round appraisal. They were looking at it from an appraisal bias perspective, but we asked kind of a bigger, broader question of how are you looking at artificial intelligence and really how the lenders need to prepare their companies. And the feedback that we got from them was, hey, you're going to be held accountable to the standards that we held you accountable to, to today, whether that is a person doing the work or whether it is automated. Um, and so I think that's really important for us to understand as an industry is that um, oftentimes there's questions of, gosh, this large language model that Mark's talking about earlier, um, it's it, it might create this kind of hallucination, this, this unintended bias, so to speak. It might deny a borrower that shouldn't have been denied. Well, of course that might happen in the beginning, but that also happens with people. <laughs> and so just like we have to train our people and our teams, we have to make sure that our systems um, are trained the right way too. And um, and we have to have systems and processes in place to check them on a regular basis. So those of you that are in that boat that are waiting to kind of see how is this going to be regulated? What are what are we really going to be held accountable? I think it's um, it's really important for you guys to, to have a good sense of that. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, I started to chat about hallucinations a little bit. Mark, I know you being knee deep in building AI yourself and leveraging those large language models uh, as you're working with lenders on a regular basis. How do you help them to make sure that the solutions that you're providing are minimizing that, that kind of risk of, of bias that can naturally happen as you're building these things out? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so you definitely need multiple layers. Like you can't just go chat GPT application <laughs> because you're going to have a higher rate and it, it can, it, there are hallucinations. They happen almost in every scenario. And we haven't even gotten it down to where there's a hundred percent no hallucination. So you need multiple layers and audit layers to catch that and however you're implementing that. And I think that that's important to, to realize. So there's, there's the audit component piece of, of it. Um, it's also, you know, what are you solving for? What can you, you know, the way the approach we've taken is what is the low hanging fruit that doesn't, isn't going to cause a buyback, <laughs> right? That's right? That is causing so much minutia. If you could free that up, you know, lenders are already down to their core best staff now because of, you know, what we've been through, but those are the leaders of, of the companies. And if they could be put in tasks towards the growth of the company and kind of maybe get rid of 20 to 30% of the minutia and all the repetitive stuff that, Jane, Jim, and Jack have to all look at, why do they all have to look at that? <laughs> why can't it just be looked at once and then it's got one set of eyes instead of three set of eyes? So it's that kind of approach concept. And then the way we approach it is that we, if you've got a checklist of items, let's say, let's get practical, let's say a loan takes, you know, this many hours to process and you've got a list of 200 items. If AI could knock out, say, 75% of those items, but you got the most critical that human still looks at in your decision-making, Anything that's a buyback risk, anything that's that, keep that for now. As yeah. we evolve and get rid of the low-hanging fruit, the minutia, that frees you up to focus on that. And then the result is that you can you can do more loans. You can uh, increase your throughput of funding velocity. You can shorten your days on warehouse cycle. Um, you can then take that all the way down the loan life cycle, which goes into title appraisal, secondary servicing, capital markets, GSC, and all the way. And then those costs need to get passed back in our belief to the originator because they pay the most. <laughs> so that, you know, that 13,000, they bear most of that. I think if you break that up, 11,000 is the originator. And then the other two grand is the other company. It's <laughs> so, not 11,000, um, <laughs> but it, it, it is a large portion of the yeah. cost origination. We, we do all know that for sure. Yeah. It's, um, but, but there are layers to the cost of origination that, 
um, outside of the the actual, you know, a, a sales compensation. And that can be everything from, right. you know, buying um, a lead in some cases, if you're consumer direct to, and including kind of your, your sales um, uh, compensation in you there. Can to, apply both ends. You're right. Exactly. Yep. I was talking mostly about the manufacturing side, but absolutely. Yep. Yep. For sure. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, having layers to address that, um, if you think about like, why does bias exist? And I think organically, unfortunately, in the first place in data is that people make decisions. We're, we are wired to make decisions based on survival. And yeah. so if a paycheck is survival or funding is survival, yeah. there might be quick decisions made, not even intentionally, you know, based on however people think in their mind. Right. And that, and so data has captured that. Yeah. And I think AI actually gives the opportunity to level set put the data set back in, make sure it's broad enough so that it is inclusive of all opportunities and everything, right? And yeah. you, you can retrain over that total inclusion. And then you create this, you know, at least there's always going to be some bias, but you can actually reduce the bias and all of that. And then when you look at like appraisal, as long as your mission isn't to fraud appraisals and fraud customers, then you're not going to train the AI that way. You're going to train it against what it, the regulatory is supposed to do. And an even better thing is, is that as uh, regulations and things get documented out there, well, guess what? The LLMs will pick that up faster than we can even like interpret that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it'll start including that. And then we get a chance to audit that. And it's like, oh yeah, that is correct. That just came out. Yeah. So it actually presents an opportunity to move faster in adoption of the things that are gonna change continuously into the industry. Okay, I have another question. And it's not on our list. Are you okay if I go off of our list you, a little bit? Yeah, I, I always go off the top of my head. So. Okay, good. Okay, okay good. <laughs> so, um, you know, I used to, uh, when when I was leading um, a mortgage company, I used to do actually annual like leadership retreats. Mm. And we would go through and I had this, this exercise where I asked everybody to find the duct tape. And it was really the the pieces in our process that we had said, oh my gosh, I got this audit finding or, oh my gosh, I got this like, you know, repurchase request and I really need to like, you know, tighten up this one part of the process. And so yes. you know, we put this duct tape on it, right? We, we find this, this solution mm -hmm. that solved that one little piece of the process. And we, we always wanted to make sure that we didn't, we didn't have duct tape on top of duct tape, on top of duct tape, right? And yes. that we really had a process that was seamless across all, all of our customer experience, but also all of our team's experience going through the process. And so I think a lot of times our industry gets caught in that mix of, because we have so many feedback loops, right? We're required to audit so many of our files where, you know, and then, and then our investors, if you sell to an aggregator or the agencies, we're also going through audits and so we're having to, and regulators are having to respond and react to all of those, those feedback loops on a regular basis. And it's easy for us to find little, little changes that we can make. And we put, put little parts of duct tape over our process. Mm -hmm. So as you think about AI, like, how does it solve for that? How does it find the duct tape? How do you, how do you eliminate maybe needing duct tape at all? That is awesome. I love your analogy, Melissa. That's fantastic. And th you know, you're hitting a great topic. Um, so thank you for that. That so a lot of you know I talked to several of our a couple of our clients about this and think about how many second check processes were implemented into your workflow because you had this really bad thing that happened and you're still paying for that probably in touches reviews people and maybe even tech stack costs yeah. and maybe the chances of that actually happening are so low but it was so bad at the time it happened you're just paying for it forever now <laughs> because it's in your workflow. So that's a piece of duct tape that would stack on each other. Yeah. And the reality is, is how do you really know where your bottlenecks or where that, you know, still applies, or maybe the regulations have changed. It's, it can be yeah. applied differently. Um, you know, you got to look at, start to the data and you got to get that out of your current workflow and assembly line to understand where the bottlenecks are. And I, I try to give something similar, Melissa, like duct tape, um, the C-suite within the, the, the company, you know, they see the biggest problems and they put out major fires. And to them, that might be the biggest delays in their company, they think, but they haven't really seen the data stacked up against itself, so against, yeah. you know, the actual um, assembly line. How long does it take in this segment all the way across the board? And if yeah. you could get that data level, which, you know, you have access to your logs, you could, it's, it's hard to get out of your system. But when you look at that in a big picture, 
you can say, hey, we've got really these bottlenecks here. Maybe we don't need that second check here. Maybe it could actually get caught at the end of this process before it funds, or maybe it could do here. And I think it's worth always looking at that as you evolve your assembly line and your tech stack. And so that's where AI can look at that and start to give you what would be more efficient. They're using it in science and disease research. Now we can put out, you know, hypothesis on a cure and it used to take humans all this testing physically to test which one could work. We need to kind of guesstimate which one might be a good approach. Now you can simulate that approach, right? And then out of that, get the top 10% simulations and just try those instead of all 100. Same thing on a loan file. You know, it's, it's, it's the same kind of approach. And so as we start to shift our thinking towards that, as we see more application for AI, that's, that's really a big opportunity around the duct tape analogy. So. I love that. Okay. I want to talk to you more about this. We'll, we might have to schedule another Spark Lab because um, we are all <laughs> up at time today. Um, oh, thank you guys so amazing. much for joining us. Um, Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, before everybody right. leaves, though, if this has been valuable, this is something super new, and we are on a mission to make sure that the industry um, knows about all of the innovation that's happening and feels super confident and comfortable in navigating that for their companies. So share it with your friends. We'd love to have them join us um, as well. And um, we'll see you again here next month. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers all planned out for the rest of the year. So can't wait to share that with you guys too. Um, Mark, we'll get you uh, set up and we'll continue our conversation around the duct tape. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I really all appreciate right. it. Thank you, Melissa. This was an honor. Really appreciate it. Great job. Thank you so much, Mark. You too. Have a good one, everybody.